most of you, but if you don't know who I am, my name's Randy Lawson, and uh, I currently serve as an elder in the Decatur Seventh-day Adventist Church, and uh, I've been to Coleman quite a few times. I really like this church. It's a great place. Um, have you ever had trouble in your life? Have you ever got some bad news, you know, uh, you think of, you know, even from the time you're young, you know, maybe you failed a test. Uh, maybe something bad's happened to you in life. You had to go tell your parents you got pulled into the office for getting in a fight or something. Uh, you know, those things kind of seem superficial, but there's always going to be trouble in our lives. You know, uh, you're going to go to the doctor and they're going to say, hey, we need to crack you open and uh, do some bypass surgery on you. Or they may say, hey, uh, it's not looking too good. You have cancer. You're going to need radiation and chemotherapy. You're going to get news like that sometimes. That's just part of being human. Sometimes you're going to get somebody to knock on your door and say, uh, are you so-and-so? Yes, I am. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but your mom died. Uh, you know, you're going to receive bad news in life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we ask as we study your word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and minds to what you're trying to tell us, Lord. And that we're inspired, Lord, to have a greater understanding of you and understand that you're a God of infinite love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, there are two verses in the Bible that I'd like to read first. The first one is uh, John, it's chapter 16, and it's verse 33. And uh, this is something that a good friend of mine said. His name's Jesus. Um, <laughs> John 13, uh, 16, verse 33. And uh, it says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world... You'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Amen. So Jesus is straight up about it. You know, in this world, there's going to be bad times. You're, you're, it's not all cake and ice cream. It's just not going to be. And, and uh, there's another verse I'd like to share with you before I get into the message completely. It's from 2 Timothy, and it's 2 Timothy 3.12. And it basically says... All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So not just the bad things that are common to existing on this sinful planet, uh, but if you're going to serve God and serve Him the way you're supposed to, you're going to suffer what? Persecution. Persecution, yeah. I mean, uh, so it, it gets a little bit worse, right? I want to ask you a few things here. How do we cope with life when these things happen to us, when the bad news arrives, uh, when the spouse says, hey, I want a divorce, when the IRS says, hey, we don't need to just review this last year's taxes, we need to go back five years. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you didn't get the loan for the mortgage that you wanted. Maybe. Your employer comes in and says, sorry, I got to let you go. I'm laying you off. You have no job anymore. So how do we cope with life when these things happen? How do we answer the questions of where is God now? How could a loving God let this happen to me? Uh, does God even see what's going on? Does he care? I want to share with you a story from the Bible, and it begins with um, Jacob. Jacob had a number of sons, and there was a famine in the land. So they eventually went down to Egypt, and there they lived a pretty good life until the king or Pharaoh that they were living under passed away. They started to grow in number as a people. And pretty soon the ruler of Egypt said, uh, we're going to have to put these people as slaves or they're going to rise up against us and take the place over. So for 400 years, the people were slaves in the land of Egypt. 
Finally, God raised up a person named Moses. Have you heard this story before? Yeah. I'm sure most of you had. He raised up Moses and asked them, asked Moses to uh, be my spokesman and deliver my people from the bondage of Egypt. The people left Egypt. God brought them out with uh, miracles of uh, deliverance. There were namely ten plagues, uh, three of which hit everyone in the land, and the last seven did not hit the Israelites. They only hit the Egyptians. He saved them through many miracles, the parting of the Red Sea. But as they got into the desert land, they began to backslide and turn against God. And he said, you're going to stay out here with me for 40 years until everyone that's seen these things is gone. You're no longer here. And to make it all worse, he told Moses, because of this one particular thing you've done, you're not going to get to come into this promised land with me. So he appointed a guy named Joshua to lead the people of Israel. He was going to lead the people into the promised land. Moses died. Joshua got the people ready to cross the Jordan. Now keep in mind, the time of year when the people were getting ready to cross the Jordan was in the springtime. The Jordan was no longer just a little stream. It was a raging river. And the people, along with their cattle, along with their children, along with their wagons and all their goods, had to cross this river. And the plan was that the priests carrying the ark were going to begin to walk into the Jordan River. And as they began to walk in the Jordan River, the waters would recede. But before then, Joshua gave the people an interesting set of instructions. He said, when the waters are backed up and the priests are standing in the middle of the dry up river, I want 12 men, one from each tribe, to grab a stone from the bottom of the riverbed and bring it out of the riverbed. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. Uh, we're in Joshua chapter 4. And I'm going to begin with verse 16. Joshua saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they should come out of the Jordan. They had already dried the rivers up. The river backed up from where it was flowing and would not cross these boundaries. Um, verse 17, Joshua commanded the priests saying, Come ye up out of the Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come out of the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted onto the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all his banks as they did before. So when they came out of the riverbed, basically the water began to flow downstream like it normally would have again. Verse 19, And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spoke unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you, until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Now before I explain where I'm going with this, I want to share a quote with you. This quote is from a, a lady named Ellen White, and it comes from uh, Life Sketches. Um, I'm going to read this quote twice to you. It says, We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Amen. Let me read that one more time. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. 
Um, Joshua knew because Moses had said, the people are eventually going to forget these great things. So take these stones. We're going to set them up for memorial. And when people ask, what do these stones mean? You're going to point back to the powerful things that God has done for you. And uh, we have to do the same thing. Amen. Sometimes we have to set memorials up. I'm not sure how you do it personally to let you know, even though things are bad right now, God's done this for me in the past. Also, this book right here has stories of how he's led his people and saved his people in the past. Amen. Um, you know, when we talk about people that have went through bad things, And we're all going to go through bad things. We sometimes want to think of Job and what happened to Job. You know, he lost all his possessions. He lost all his kids. Then his wife turned against him. But with Job, in the end, he ended up having twice as much as he did in the beginning. But the person we're going to focus on today is an individual that went through bad things and things never got any better for this individual. They, got, they went from bad to worse. This individual was a guy named Jeremiah. Most of you have heard of Jeremiah. He was a prophet. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what he preached as a prophet. I'm going to tell you more about Jeremiah's life, what Jeremiah went through. Um, Jeremiah was young when God called him into the ministry. It was during uh, the time of uh, Josiah, King Josiah. During Josiah's 13th year that he was called to prophetic ministry. And from everything I found, he was only between 17 and 20 years old. He was pretty young. Um, he initially protested against God calling him to the prophetic ministry. He uh, said that, Lord, I'm too young. The first thing God told him was, hey, I got some bad news for you. You're not to get married. You're not to have children. To a young male Israelite, that's like getting hit with a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. You know, your family line ends with you at that point. Uh, Jeremiah's ministry ended up lasting through the rest of Josiah's reign and through the reigns of Judah's last four rulers, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Jeremiah actually wrote the books of Lamentations, Psalm 89, uh, the book named Jeremiah, and the last part of 2 Kings. The book that bears his name, Jeremiah, is the second longest book in Scripture by number of words. The life of Jeremiah was one, if not the most difficult, of all the trial-filled existences of any of the Old Testament prophets. Because of what he saw and what he preached, he suffered. And Jeremiah was often referred to as what? Anybody know? The weeping prophet, right? Uh, at the start of his prof prophetic ministry, God told him directly that the majority of the people were going to reject his message. And after preaching for several years, his own family who lived in his hometown turned against him. They hated his message so much that they plotted to kill him. Pastor, who was a chief governor and priest in Jerusalem's temple, had the prophet whipped and put into stocks. And during the reign of Jehoiakim, after he gave a temple message calling for the people to repent, a mob of priests and prophets, these were actually false prophets and bad priests, uh, tried to have Jeremiah executed. 
King Jehoiakim would later threaten his life and the life of his scribe Baruch. A false prophet named Hananiah ridiculed him publicly for, uh, for his warnings and accused Jeremiah of being a liar. Some of Zedekiah's princes, after he became a Babylonian puppet king over, or over Judah, had Jeremiah arrested, accused of treason, beaten, and thrown into prison. Other people who rejected his message had him moved from the palace prison into a deep but empty well. But the bottom of the well was wet, so he sank into the mire of the well as he was in there. Jeremiah personally experienced the Babylonian siege against Jerusalem and not only saw the sufferings of the people, but saw them taken away as captives. After the destruction of Jerusalem, the Babylonians, of all people, released Jeremiah from prison. And they told him he could go live under the protection of the governor, Jedaliah. But the governor, unfortunately, less than two months later, was murdered. And the prophet was then taken against his will by some Jewish rebels to Egypt, where it's believed they murdered him. Mm. So, this individual, Jeremiah, really had it rough. I want to ask you something. Has anyone here ever read the book of Lamentations? That's a very tough read. I want to tell you a little bit about Lamentations first. Lamentations is written in a poetic form called a chiasm. And in a chiasm, think of it as a pyramid where the stuff here lines up with the stuff here. In other words, in the book of Lamentations, to make it more simple, there are five chapters. And if you think of it as a, a chiasm pyramid, the third chapter is up here. The first and fifth are here. The second and fourth are here. And the first and fifth are going to sort of mirror each other. The second and fourth are going to sort of mirror each other. But that third chapter, in the middle of that third chapter, is the most critical point of that book. Just like the book of Revelation is written in a form of a chiasm. Does anyone know what's in the middle of the book of Revelation? Chapter 14. Well, the three angels' message, from 12 to 14, yes. But uh, that is the most critical point of Revelation. Now, we're going to go to the book of Lamentations. And the reason we're going to the book of Lamentations is we're going to see through this book the things that Jeremiah actually went through. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing, but I want to cover enough of this to where you understand that it's written in the form of chiasm and you understand how bad things were for Jeremiah. Let's go to Lamentations chapter 1. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Okay, we're going to begin with verses 3 through 5 of chapter 1. It says, Judah has gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwells among the heathen. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The way of Zion do mourn because none come to her solemn feasts. Uh, all her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgin, virgins are afflicted and she's in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief. Her enemies prosper for the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions, and her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Um, in other words, the religious services that were once uh, throughout the land, they're not being practiced anymore, and the enemies have the upper hand on them. They're basically having to serve their enemies. Let's look at verse 7. Jerusalem remembered the days of her affliction and of her miseries and all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old when her People fell into the hands of the enemy, and none did help her. The adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbaths. Now keep in mind, one important reason we're talking about Jeremiah is Jeremiah is like the type, and the church of today is like the anti-type, because who was coming against Jerusalem at the time? Babylon. Now, the church today is being faced by an enemy. Who is that enemy? 
Babylon, spiritual Babylon. Okay, keep that in mind. But I thought it was strange that in verse 7 it says their adversary saw her and did mock at her what? Sabbath. Sabbath. Have any of you ever caught the business about keeping the Sabbath holy? Yeah. My, uh, my in-laws, uh, they don't really say it to me too much, but uh, they think we're crazy. <laughs> uh, I think it's cool, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, verse 11. And all her people sigh. They seek bread. They've given their pleasant things for, mo uh, for meat to relieve the soul. Oh, Lord, and consider... and. I am become vile. In other words, they've had to sell everything that they had that they valued just for scraps of food. Uh, verse 15. Uh, the Lord has trodden underfoot all the mighty men in the midst of me. He's called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as a winepress. 16. For these things I weep. My eye, my eye runneth down with water because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemies prevail. Anybody that could fight is dead or they've been hauled off at this point. And uh, it's a bad situation. Let's look at verse 18. The Lord is righteous for I have rebelled against his commandment. commandment. Here I pray you all people. Behold my sorrow, my virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. It's something else how Jeremiah puts himself right in there with them. said, I'm just as guilty as they are. But uh, he says that the Lord's right for having done this stuff. Let's go to chapter 2. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. The Lord was as an enemy. He swallowed up Israel and he swallowed up all her palaces. He has destroyed the strongholds and has increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. And he has violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He has destroyed his palaces of the assembly. The Lord has caused the solemn feast and the Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion and has despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. Why do you think God allowed these things to be taken away? Yeah, uh, these people had mixed Babylonian religion with their own religion. Uh, what was once to point people to a loving God was now just sort of a mixed bunch of nothing, you know. Uh, they, they had confused the, the nations instead of bringing them to the light. Uh, let's go to verse 9. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He's destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. Um, the law is no more? Who did he give the law to? Israel. Yeah, they despised it. And uh, the prophets are no longer getting any visions. Why, why do you think that is? They only want to hear good and pleasant things. They didn't want to hear the word of Jeremiah that he had tried to give to them. They rejected that. So they wanted to make their own people that they called prophets and listen to them. So God said, well, I'm not telling you anything else. If you're not going to listen to what I say through my true prophets, that's it. You know, no more. Um, 11 and 12. Mine eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured onto the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people because the children and the suckling swoon in the streets of the city when they say to their mothers, where's the food and drink? When they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out in their mother's bosom. These kids are walking through there basically starving to death and it's breaking Jeremiah's heart. Uh, he's a... I'm a cold individual. I mean, I hate to say it, but very few things affect me, you know. Uh, my wife's raising some guineas and chickens, and when the dogs will kill one, oh, she just has a come apart. And with me, I just go grab a shovel and dig a hole. And I don't know, but if I was seeing this, I, I believe I would be greatly affected. Um, it gets worse, though. Let's look at verse 14. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee and have not discovered your iniquity or turned away your captivity, but have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. 
there's the false prophets. You know, they're wanting to tell them smooth things. You know, everything's good. You know, it's all going to be uh, cake and ice cream. But uh, that's not what God said through the prophet of Jeremiah. Uh, um, let's look at verse 17. The Lord has done that which he has devised. He's fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He's thrown down and he is not pitied. And he has caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He has set up the horn of thine adversaries. Verse 20 and 21. Behold, O Lord, and consider to whom thou hast done this. Shall the women eat the fruit and children of a span long? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? The young and the old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. Thou hast slain them in the day of thine anger. Thou hast killed them and hast not pity. Things have gotten so bad that women are consuming their own children. Keep in mind, not only was Jerusalem under siege by Babylon at the time, but there was also a famine in the land, so it was compounded. Uh, since Lamentations is written in the form of a chiasm, I want to skip chapter 3. We're going to come back and see what the focal point of this chiasm is later, but let's go to Lamentations chapter 4. Uh, let's begin in 4 and 5. And it says, The tongue of the suckling child cleaves to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man baketh it unto them. Did you hear something similar in one of the other chapters? Yes, you have. Uh, they that de did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dung hills. These individuals that were such picky eaters... Now they're going through the dunghill looking for some morsel or scrap that they can eat. Uh, seven and eight. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was a sapphire. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaves to their bones and it's withered. They have become like a stick. Verses 9 and 10. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away stricken though they uh, for wants of the fields, uh, fruits of the field. In other words, the ones that were killed outright with a sword, they're a lot better off than these people walking around here starving to death. Uh, verse 10. The hands of the pitiful women have boiled their own children. And they were meat for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Again, you've heard this before, right? Because it's written as a chiasm. And chapter 2 mimics chapter 4. Uh, let's look at verses 13 and 14. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her, they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. Uh, let's go to chapter 5 and let's look at verses 2. I'll start with verse 2. Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our house to aliens. Uh, let's look at 4 and 5. We've drunk in our water for money. Our wood is sold to us. Our necks are under persecution and we labor and have no rest. Again, this is mimicking some of the stuff you heard in chapter 1. Uh, basically, the nations around them are ruling over them. That's something you heard in chapter 1. We're going to look at uh, 11, 12, and 13. So they ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hand. They, faces of the elders are not honored. They took the young men to grind and the women fell under the wood. Can you see what... Jeremiah's having to see what he's looking at. The desolation. The people are starving to death. They're to the point where they're consuming their children. Let's go to the peak of the chiasm. Let's go to chapter 3. Now I'm going to begin with verse 1. But that's not the focal point. Let's begin in verse 1. I am the man that's seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He's led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. 
Surely against me he's turned. He turns his hand against me all day. My flesh and my skin he's made old. He's broken my bones. He's built it against me and compassed a wall with gall and travail. He set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He's hedged me about and I can't get out. He's made my chain heavy. And when I cry and shout, he shouteth out my prayer. He has enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He's made my path crooked. He was under me as a bear that was lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He's turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He's made me desolate. He's been his bow and set his mark for the arrow. He's caused the arrow of his quiver to enter my reins. I was a derision to all my people, and they made up songs about me. He's filled me with bitterness, has made me to drink wormwood. He's broken my teeth with gravel stones and has covered me with ashes. And thou has removed my soul from far off uh, from peace. I forgot what prosperity was. And I said, my strength and my hope has perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. Now, you see what he's going through, the torture of soul and mind because of the things going on around him, right? Okay, now we're getting, we're at the tip top of the chiasm. We're in verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because of his compassions, fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It's good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It's good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sits alone and keeps silent because it's pouring on him. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If it be, there may be hope. He gives his cheek to them that smite him, and he's filled with reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Now, that's the peak of the chiasm. It gets worse from there. It goes back, like at the beginning, nothing but bad. At the end, there's nothing but bad. So how could Joseph, sorry, how could Jeremiah say these things that he has these hopes that he trusts in the Lord. Let me give you a clue. Do you remember who I said was the reigning king in Israel when Jeremiah was called to the prophetic ministry? Josiah. The temple was in ruins when Josiah became king. And one of the things Josiah wanted to do was to restore the temple to some of its old glory. While they were doing renovations in the temple, an interesting thing happened. They found something. Does anybody know what they found? The lost book of the law. When that book was found, Jeremiah dug into that thing. He put it into his heart. He put it into his mind. And he took on the responsibility of teaching other people what that book said. And in that book of the law, there were stories like the one we read earlier about Joshua setting up these stones of memorial. He could remember what God had done for the people in the past. So he was able to look forward to a future of hope, whether he got to see it or not. Now, I don't want to leave you with a bleak message like that. I want to leave you with a little bit of hope and encouragement here. Uh, so I would like to share a few things from God's Word. 
Psalm 46, 1 through 3. And if you want to follow me there, that would be great. Uh, but uh, trust me, I'm reading from the King James Version. and You can check it later. Psalm 46, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Through the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and swell thereof. Um, another promise, Psalm 59, 16 and 17. I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Uh, let's look at Nahum, Nahum 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Um, we can set up whatever devices around us for our own personal security, but outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no security. God's our only security. Uh, let's close with hymn number 529. If you would, let's stand and sing that. <clears throat> 